All right, cool. It is seven o'clock, so I'm gonna go ahead and start with the presentation then. All right. So today we're gonna be talking about buffer overflows. So we're actually gonna start doing some exploit development. Quite fun. Um, so first things first, if you don't know who I am, I'm Vincent. I'm the president of this club. Um, if you have any questions, or you can email me at president at uf.org. All right. Cool. So uh, first things first, if you're not on the mailing list, uh, definitely join the mailing list because we send out a lot of important information there. Like if we have to reschedule a meeting or something. This is where we're gonna do it first. Like first thing first. Um, so yeah, uh, to to get on the mailing list, send an email to president at ufset.org with uh, the subject being mailing list and then your first name and the last name. It makes it nice and easy for me to add you. So okay, now that's a sheep. So diving. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yes. So diving in. Um, exploits have a lot of different forms. Uh, so there's not just like one kind of exploit. Um, there's a lot of different types. Uh, you have stack overflows. You have heap overflows. You have format string vulnerabilities. Uh, in some cases, you can leverage null pointer dereferences to gain control of uh, the instructional pointer. And sometimes there's accidental or not accidental backdoors in your program. Access to. So, um, a pretty famous exploit where it's beginning, becoming very famous in the news rate lately is the shell shock exploit. So, as you see, this exploit isn't like very complicated. It didn't take a huge number of um, a, a huge number of lines of code to write. No, this is it. This is the exploit. All right. Okay. So, exploits. Where can they come from? Um, just about anywhere a user can enter data. So file input can be a source of ex uh, can be a, can be in, like a avenue which um, a bad guy can inject uh, shell code and stuff. Um, you could do it over a network connection, uh, just the standard input of a program. Like you write a program in C and it's taking in like input into a buffer that can be overflowed. Uh, and environmental variables too. They can also be leveraged. Uh, so today we're just going to be taking a look at local buffer overflow exploits. And when I say local, I mean not over a network connection. So they're more or less going to either be from a file or, say, from standard input. I think all the examples we actually use today are from standard input, so the challenges themselves. Uh, so we're just going to be focusing on manipulating EIP. Um, we're not going to have to worry about ASLR. Uh, that's address space layout randomization. And we're not going to have to worry about DEP or uh, I think Linux, they just refer to it as NX, non-executable. So non, no non-executable stack stuff, we don't, we're not going to really worry about that. Um, and the stuff that we're going to be doing with in C and C++, it's not really going to work in interpreted languages like Python. So this is a heads up. So previously on SID, uh, we went over like the, um, a binary, what it looks like at like the text segment, what it actually looked like in a file. So we used HTE to actually like look at like uh, the instructions inside of a file, and we were able to kind of manipulate it that way, right? Um, and we learned that programs are just simply ordered bytes in a file. Uh, they're just instructions for the computer. So we, we mentioned this very briefly, but a program is going to be mapped into a virtual memory address space. Um, so this virtual, I, I just mentioned this virtual memory address space because it is very important for um, the model security used by modern computers. So basically, if you're running a computer, if you're running a program, uh, there's not a real way to just like manipulate EIP to a completely different program. I mean, well, you can because debuggers do that all the time, but you have to have permissions to do that. It's it's not exactly going to work. All right. So uh, looking at the actual model of memory inside of a computer, uh, we're going to be looking at the stack. Um, and you see at the bottom there, that's uh, like where the text segment would be loaded into memory. But we're going to be looking specifically at the stack. There are other segments. There's the heap, but uh, yeah, we're focusing on the stack today. Uh, so what is a stack? Uh, it's an important thing to know when you're trying to exploit like uh, a stack-based buffer overflow, right? So this is a picture here which sort of just illustrates um, what a stack is. It's sort of a data structure which follows this policy of uh, first in, last out. 
So in this diagram, on the far left, you see like an empty stack, and to get things onto it, we can like push green, and the green block goes on the stack, and then we can push blue, and blue will be on top of that green. And then the way that we can get data off of it is through popping it off. Um, compilers aren't necessarily going to follow this, because compilers like to optimize things. Um, sometimes they'll just like go into the middle of a stack and just be like, yeah, I don't care about the stuff underneath it. All right, so is the stack stuff useful? Yes, it is very useful. It is very important. Uh, function arguments are pushed onto the stack, usually in reverse order. Uh, local variables, they're going to be pushed onto the stack. And this is very important for a buffer overflow exploit, is the return address of a function is going to be pushed on the stack. So that's going to be our objective. We want to somehow manipulate this return address so that when the function exits, we have control of EIP, the instructional pointer. OK, so first we need to talk about a stack frame. Um, <laughs> uh, so when I'm introducing, uh, to introduce a stack frame, um, you need to know about three pretty important registers. You need to know about ESP, which is the stack pointer. You need to know about EBP, that's the base pointer, and EIP, which is the instructional pointer. So ESP will pretty much always point to the top of your stack, and EBP will always pretty much point to the bottom of the stack. It's a little confusing because ESP will be at like the lowest memory address, and EBP will be at the highest memory address. Uh, that's just because the stack grows towards lower memory addresses. So when I say top of the stack, I'm really meaning the uh, lowest, lower memory addresses. Um, so something to keep in mind is even like the main function is a function it's still going to follow this pattern of uh, pushing things on the stack and stuff. Um, so I'm actually going to, so this is an example of when you disassemble um, an elf executable of like the stack frame being created. Uh, you're going to push EBP onto the stack to save it. Um, then you're going to move ESP and EBP, and then you're going to decrement the stack pointer. So that's sort of how you create like something called a stack frame, which is sort of where all your function variables are going to be kind of managed. Uh, so here's a pretty good picture that I made that actually illustrates this a little better. So initially, EBP and ESP are going to kind of point to the same spot. Um, we're going to then push sheep on. ESP is going to be moved down. Uh, we're going to push another. We're going to push the return address on. ESP is going to move down. EBP is still pointing toward the bottom of that stack. Um, then if you look at the fourth box, uh, once again, we push the old base pointer because we're creating a new stack frame. And then we're going to move ESP into EBP, um, therefore setting a new bottom of a stack. So that way we can call another function. Um, so just to go back again, uh, the last two frames correspond to these two instructions here. Push EBP and then move ESP into EBP. So kind of labeled them at the bottom of the boxes. All right, cool. Um, let me. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna actually go through like what it looks like um, for this particular function. <coughs> so we just have a function called main uh, that has, a, which takes like the number of arguments um, at command line and also like the actual string arguments at command line, and then we have two just uh, buffers which are 16 bytes large. All right. So this is our stack initially. It's completely empty. Um, so the first thing that's going to happen is, in reverse order, we're going to push uh, a pointer to our, um, our command line arguments. And then we're going to push the number of command line arguments, because that was the first parameter to the function. Then we're going to push the return address, um, so that way when main finishes running, we know where to return in our flow of execution. Uh, we're going to push the base pointer, so we know what our old base pointer is, so we can get that back. Uh, and then we're going to push our local variables in. All right, so that way when we, and when we want to call another function, this exact same thing is going to happen over again. So when you have functions, I call functions, it's sort of just going to wrap up like this over and over again. Um, so just as a realization, although we're doing like functiony things with like the stack, uh, your actual instructions they're still in the text segment. They're not on the stack. So the stack is going to be used for like your variables, uh, your kind of like dynamic stuff, right? Usually the text segment is not going to be writable or anything. 
Yeah, so by default, the stack um, is not going to allow you to execute things on it, uh, especially when you compile it with GCC. You're going to have to use another flag. So you can do it, but it's <coughs> like, you probably don't want to, because you're going to get exploited. So I'm going to stop here for a second um, and take questions, because I assume everything I went over is probably pretty confusing. Uh, I know I had a pretty hard time with it when I first uh, went through it. All right, so did anyone not completely understand that? No one has a question? All right, cool. That means, that means everybody yeah, has a question. Yeah, all right. Yeah, all right. <laughs> you don't know to ask. That, that's fair enough. Fair enough. OK. All right. Um, yeah, so this, is, this stuff is really hard, especially if it's your first time seeing it. Like, it took me like months and months of reading to actually get that. And I went over that pretty quickly, didn't I? Um, I had to take a class. <laughs> so, so you have examples, and when the examples come, we can look at them. Yes, by exactly. That's exactly what we're going to do. Um, when we get to the demo section, this kind of organization in memory is going to be a little more clear. Yeah. All right. So this is an example of like an actual vulnerable function, right? An actual vulnerable program. Uh, the reason why it's pro vulnerable is because what it's doing, so what this program is doing in general is it's taking our buffer, vulnerable buffer, and then it's copying um, our first command line argument into it. Um, the problem with this is we didn't uh, limit the size of the command line buffer. So in C, a character takes up one byte of memory. <coughs> and what we've done here is we declared two arrays that are 16 bytes of memory large, right? Uh, so we only have 16 bytes of memory we can put like a string into. Um, the problem is, yeah, we're not limiting the size, so what's going to happen is if the user enters more than 16 bytes of information, that's going to start overflowing into buffer. Uh, and if the user enters even more input than that, enters even more than 32 bytes of information, that's going to flow into EBP. And if there's even more information, like 30, more than 36 bytes, it's going to start overflowing into the return address. And that's sort of where you're going to be able to hijack the IP. All right. Uh, so once again, this is sort of like what your stack frame is going to look like. Um, and this concept of memory address, the stack growing downwards, is pretty important uh, when we're talking about overflowing buffers in a stack-based uh, context. Um, the reason why that <laughs> is important is because uh, character buffer is going to appear before uh, vulnerable buffer is, which is sort of why it makes it possible to overflow that. Um, and also the base pointer itself is going to appear on the stack before that, so it's able to be overflowed. Uh, so what's going to happen is we're going to have vulnerable buffer, and we're going to have buffer, and what we're going to do is we're going to copy things into buffer. So buffer is going to be full of information from our uh, command line arguments. And then if we enter more than the size that buffer is allowed to have, which was 16 bytes, then our data is going to start overflowing into our base pointer. And if we keep overflowing things, it's going to overflow and then cover our return address. And that's the objective, is we want to actually manipulate this return address with an address from vulnerable buffer. And that's going to be a little more clear when we actually do uh, like a real demo. Um, yeah. So it is time for a demo. Uh, 